If you are receiving this transmission, you are the resistance. Declaring war on the New World Order. TruthRadioShow.com And welcome to the Dan Bedani Show right here at TruthRadioShow.com. And we are now on to Matthew chapter 22. So we are doing a comprehensive study, in-depth study of the book of Matthew. And we are now on to chapter 22. And what we do, guys, is a special uh, biblical study approach. And we pray for wisdom and understanding. And we read scripture in its context because the context is key. And let the scripture interpret scripture. So we give one a prayer. Once again, to our Heavenly Father, Almighty, and Jesus, please forgive us of our trespasses and our sins and the wrong things we've done and thought today. And please cleanse us. And Heavenly Father, we ask you to once again send your divine teacher, the Holy Spirit, to us to help us understand your awesome word today and to help us understand the book of Matthew chapter 22 and to pull out all the information that you want us to learn today. In your heavenly name, amen. So that being said, guys, like we always encourage people to do, open up your Bibles, even though it's on video. And we do have audio series on shakeawakeradio.com. So um, regardless, open up your Bibles because we always you know, encourage people to read the Bible for themselves. You know what I mean? Plain and simple. We're supposed to read the Bible, and that's the only plan that you should be trusting. God's plan is the only plan that matters. So you're not to take my word for it or anybody else's word for it. You need to read it for yourselves. So we're going to do just that today, and we're going to really get into the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 22 here, to really pull out all the information that's being talked about. So um, I'm trying not to say the same thing every every chapter we do, but for new listeners here, if you miss chapters 1 through 21, uh, we have it in our series here. So if you're looking for somebody just to read through the Bible, we don't do that here. We take our time, we examine every little verse, every word, to understand it in its context, not just the verse, but the context of it, the full meaning and understanding that we're supposed to do. Because the Bible is not like a textbook, it's not like a magazine or a novel, just to skim through and read. No, we don't do that yet. We need to take your time and fully understand the scriptures of what it is for. You know what I mean? And, um, there's so much context in the scriptures. So, uh, you know, we begin at chapter 22 here. When, uh, you know, chapter 21, we learn that, once again, the chief priests and the scribes and whatnot, they were trying to go Jesus, once again, into saying the wrong thing. As we've seen for the last couple chapters now. They're trying to um, punish Jesus, basically. You know, say he's a false prophet, whatever, blasphemy, whatever the case they're trying to do. And in uh, chapter 21, we just discussed, though, was they're yelling at Jesus, getting upset because he was in the temple of God healing people, right? But yet, right before that, they had no problem when their people and all this turning the house of God into a marketplace, into a den of thieves. As Jesus said. You know what I mean? So that right now what they're trying to do is they're trying to convict Jesus. They're trying to get him for blasphemy and everything else. So uh, here we are, chapter 22. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, now again, this is a continuation reading this context. And if you didn't understand chapter 21, I would highly suggest you to go back Watch the chapter 21 series before you go any further because you're not going to understand what we're talking about here. So again, the, uh, the chief priests and whatnot, they were trying to lead Jesus into saying the wrong stuff. So Jesus, they're asking Jesus questions and Jesus asking them questions in return to the parables. So, and Jesus answered and spoke unto them again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven is unlike a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they should not come. And again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. So, again, you need to uh, go watch uh, chapter 21 to understand what's going on here. The continuation of Jesus talking the parables. Because, uh, again, um, like I explain all the time, the reason why Jesus talked to parables from because over the generations, over the years, words change, have different meanings, and they can change the whole concept of things, right? Jesus understood that. He wanted the word to be out forever, you know what I mean? So every generation, every age, 
that can completely understand him without misinterpreting. You don't need to interpret it when you read it in its context. This is why he talked in parables, so you can completely understand what he's talking about. Today we call them layman's terms. We use examples to express what we're talking about. If nobody understands what he's saying, right? So parables we use, as, as in other words, for layman's terms in the modern day era. So this is why Jesus said this. So now he's on to another parable saying, uh, talking about a king, right? And which made a marriage for a son. So he's preparing a marriage for the king. He's preparing a marriage for a son. And a son is what? An heir to the throne, right? He's next in charge, the first son anyway. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. And again, he sent forth other servants saying, because he, he's asking servants uh, to come to the wedding, right? And they, they didn't want to come, right? So again, he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat ones are killed, and all things are ready. Come out to the marriage. So he said, I have the food ready. Okay, everything's ready. Come on, just come to the marriage. I need people at my son's wedding. So he told the servants to tell these people, right? But they made light of it and went their ways and one to his farm and another to his merchandise, right? So they made light of it, like, yeah, whatever. You know, make a joke of it. Who cares, you know? And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. So they slew the servants. And But when the king had heard of this, thereof he was wroth. He was mad. <laughs> because this is the second time he sent his servants out to tell these people, come to my son's wedding, right? They thought it was a joke, made light of it, yeah, right? Like saying, yeah, whatever, who cares, right? And they took the servants and they killed them. They slew them. So when the king found out, he was very angry, right? He was wroth. That's what angry means in the you know, scriptures here. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up the city. You know, the thing is, the king was sitting there, I'm inviting you to my son's wedding. It's a grand banquet, ballroom, the whole nine yards, right? I got all the best food and everything else, and you're not coming. So I sent them out again to tell you, hey, we got food and everything else, my servants, but you end up killing my servants. So I'm going to send forth my army and destroy you. Plain and simple, and your city, right? And he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but which were bidden were not worthy. So you see what's going on here? This The parable that's going on, right? Right? Does that not sound familiar? Many a call, but few will go. God is, this parable is saying that God has called every one of you across the world right now. Everybody. You're welcome to the, the wedding, or to come into the kingdom of God. And he talks about the church being a woman, you know, the, you know, in the marriage of the church, which is when he redeems us from, uh, you know, resurrects us and everything. Everybody's welcome to this. You understand? And people laugh at it, they mock it, and people, some people watching this right now are probably saying, oh, here we go, Bible thumpers, make some light of it, right? Joke around, you know, like just bash it, right? God's telling you, if you're a believer right now, God's saying, hey, listen, you're welcome to my kingdom. And the marriage he's talking about here, yeah, that's what the resurrection. That's what this parable is saying right here. He's calling you, okay? You have an invitation to go to the grand wedding of all time. But you're going to mock it, that you're going to kill the servants, in other words, kill the people, people like us who go tell you the word of God, and people go kill us. We, we, we the people, the remnant, right? We're going out to the world to tell them, hey, there's an invitation for you to the kingdom of God for eternity. That's what Jesus is saying right here. And many of us are killed all across this planet right now. People go to the Middle East and everything else to try to bring witness to the word of God and they're killed for doing that. This is what this is saying, guys. In verse 9, it says, Go therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid them to the marriage. So he says, Go everywhere. Ask anybody, say, Everybody, you're all welcome to the marriage. You get the parable now? In other words, he's telling all of us, go into the whole world, tell everybody, you're all welcome to this great marriage. So those servants went out to the highways and gathered together as many people they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests, right? Bad and good. 
How many bad people did Jesus save? How many good people did Jesus? It doesn't matter if you're bad or good. We all need Jesus, right? That's the point of the parable. Okay, this the, you know the 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 kingdom of God has got a grand invitation for everybody, but many are called and few go. It's unfortunate, and He's offering the whole world to you. I mean, the whole kingdom of God for you. If you're out there, you're a sinner, you've done bad things, guys. All you have to do is come to the cross and repent. Doesn't matter what you did. Doesn't matter. Come to the cross, repent. Because he, he, he saves the bad and the good. So you are invited to this grand wedding. And that wedding he's talking about here is not, you know, woman and man. It is the wedding is like uh, the, the resurrection of Jesus. I'm sorry, the resurrection of the dead. So when Jesus returns to the earth here, he resurrects all that believe in him from the grave. And uh, whoever's here left alive is going to be caught up with them. That's the marriage he's talking about. The marriage of the church. It's the people, not a religion or nothing like that. It's not the Catholic Church, not the you know, 40,000 different denominations, the Christianity, none of that. You know what I mean? This is what he's talking about. You. You have this grand invitation to go to the, to the greatest wedding of all time. Then you got to mock it, you got to laugh at it, then you got to kill the people who invited you, the people like us who bring you that invitation. All you have to do is accept it. But you got to kill the people that do that. That's what he's talking about. <laughs> and 11 here, verse 11, and when the king came to see the guest, he saw their man, which had uh, not a wedding garment on. So this guy didn't have a garment on, you know, because he dressed nice to go to a wedding, right? And he said to him, friend, how come you come here neither having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And he said to the king, to the servants, bind him here and foot and take him away. And check this out, right? There's a meaning behind this. Cast him into outer darkness and shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So people, we say people come to God, all right? People do come to God, but they, they'll come to God, right? But they won't repent. They'll continue to do evil and uh, just live a sinful, disgusting life. And you've gotten, how many times have you heard in the scriptures, right, about having clean garments? Jesus' blood is the only thing that washes those garments, guys. You could have the whitest garment in the world, spiritually speaking, all right? The only the blood of Jesus can wash those pure white, and make them whole, pure, right? So who's he talking about? So, yeah, like I said, everybody's called, right? And even the, the people who do accept it, right? How many of them are still going to go on? Oh, I believe in Jesus. I can go do whatever the heck I want. We heard this in the dispensational churches. Oh, once you believe in Jesus, you can go live with any kind of life you want. What saved always saved, right? That dispensationalist garbage. Those are the people he's talking about, yeah? God's going to come to you. Whoa, hold on. Your garment is filthy. And you're going to be cast wind into outer darkness. There should be weeping gnashing national teeth. Where is that? That's called hell. Then after the judgment, you go into like a fire. <laughs> you go from jail, hell, into the big prison, the big yard, the lake of fire. And Jesus says, for many are called, everybody is called, but only few are chosen. And you, how do you get chosen? All you have to do is obey the will of God. Sit. Repent of your sins, come to him, and try to live the best you can for the Lord. Keep those garments clean. You know what I mean? You don't say, oh, I want to save the only save, I can do whatever I want. That's garbage. But this grand invitation to this wedding is welcome to everybody. And we talk about having a, um, a garment on, have something nice. In other words, like it's not a physical garment. This is a spiritual speaking, like, a, you know, we should have, you know, your sins are told by Jesus and repent from them. Don't do them again, you know? So, um, this is again, Jesus talk, telling this parable again to the Pharisees, right? Then, when it's, then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in this talk. So, they, they're taking counsel now, like, all right, how are we going to go Jesus to say something blasphemous? So, we have uh, probable cause to arrest him, right? To have him arrested and uh, killed. How are we going to do this? So now they're stumped. You know, like, oh man, everything we're asking him, he's coming up with answers that are blowing us away. What are we going to do? 
<laughs> you know what I mean? They're like taking counsel. In other words, they're talking about this. Like, oh, man, what are we going to do? Uh, so anyway, and he sent out unto him their disciples with the Heridian saying, Master, we know that our true and teach us the way of God and the truth. Neither care us for the, any man, for they regard us not in personal men. And so tell us thereof, what kind of stone? It is lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? So this is the question, right, they all come up with. They're asking Jesus, is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not, right? Caesar, the ruler of Rome, the emperor of Rome there. So tribute would be like pertaining to taxes and um, fees, whatever, the, you know, you lived in Rome at the time, you would have to give on to um, Caesar. Right? So they're asking this, right? This is one of the questions trying to go Jesus is saying the wrong thing. Uh, to even get Rome, uh, uh, Caesar, to persecute Jesus, right? So, but Jesus perceived their wickedness. He knew, in other words, he knew about their wickedness. He, he knew what they were up to. And he said, why are you tempting me, you hypocrites? He literally called them hypocrites. And I know people say, well, Dan, you speak, uh, you're not politically correct. Well, Jesus wasn't even. We're not supposed to be politically correct. You know, Jesus, Paul, Peter, they told you straight up what the heck was going to go on. Plain and simple. They didn't hold back. And Christians should not be, uh, whatever you want to call yourself, Christian or uh, follow Jesus Christ, you should not be politically correct. You need to tell people bold, straight up. Plain and simple. And Jesus said, why tempt me? Why are you tempting me more? Because he knew the wickedness. He knew the deceitfulness. He knew they were up to no good. And he said, why are you tempting me for you hypocrites? And he said, show me the money. And they brought him unto a penny, right? So he took the penny and he said unto them, whose image is on in superscription? Whose image is the sound of coin? Jesus knew who it was. He's just making a point here. He's asking the scribes, whose image, uh, the Pharisees, I'm sorry, Whose image is on this coin right here? That's what he's asking, right? And they said unto him, Caesar's. Then said unto them, Jesus said, because um, they told him, he, Jesus asked them whose uh, image is this, and they told him it's Caesar's image, right? And his inscription, no matter. And Jesus said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are of God. So we need to separate the things of the world from the things of the God. Separate the things from the world and separate from the things of God. Point and simple. And he's saying, yeah, if it's Caesar's, give it to Caesar. You got a coin with Caesar's name, give it to render to him, and you need to uh, render the things that are God's gods. Point and simple. And when they heard these words, they marveled. They were like, just like, wow, oh man, we, we could do it again. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't go to him until uh, saying something wrong. And they left him and went their way because they had nothing on him. Again, the you know, Pharisees, the chief priests and all that, they're trying to get Jesus to say something to get him convicted. Plain and simple. And if he didn't have multitudes with him, they would have tried to uh, you know, attack him, whatever the case. But yeah. So anyway, so the same day came to him the Sadducees, and they said that there is no resurrection in Aston. So the same day, you know, right after this, the same, you know, the same day here, um, the Sadducees came to him and asked him, well, first they said, there is no resurrection. And he asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up his seed to another brother. So in this uh, way, basically, if you just say you had, you're the head brother, right? You're the oldest brother, right? You die. You, the next one in line that's not married, you know, your second oldest brother behind you, marries that wife. She say he died now, right? The next one marries him. It goes down the line, right? So that's what he's talking about. So that was, that was in Moses' rule, right? If a man dies and have no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up their seed unto his brother. So now therefore, where the seven brethren, talking about the last, right? The first one he had married her wife, the deceased and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. So they're asking, they're, they're bringing us to Jesus, right? And likewise, the second also, the third, and to the seventh. So all the way down the line, like I can just explain, right? And the last of all the women also died. So in other words, the, the brothers all died. She like literally had, she married everyone. She was married to all seven of them, right? 
that she ended up dying. So therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be in, in, of the seven? For they had all had her. So they're asking Jesus. She was married to every one of these guys, right? all seven of them, right? She ended up dying. So in heaven, who in the resurrection, when everybody's resurrected, right? Whose wife she's going to be? That would be a good question, right? But Jesus answered them and said unto them, You... Um, Ye do not know the scriptures, nor the power of God. So he's just saying, you guys don't know the scriptures? Again, you know, he's asking, well, you guys don't, it is written, you guys don't know the scriptures? Nor the power of God. And he says, for in the resurrection, neither people neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as angels of God in heaven. So he's saying in the afterlife, guys, we, in the resurrection, we don't marry anybody. Your wife with you right now becomes your sister. And you say you're married to a widow, right? Yeah. And you're like, oh man. Like my mother, right? She was married uh, three times, right? I think my real father was too. And um, I was married once, about to get married again, right? So who's going to be my wife in heaven? Neither of them. Me and the or Michelle, neither one are going to be my wife's because in the, in the resurrection, you, you don't give marriage or you give it to a marriage or you don't get married, plain and simple. We're going to be like the angels in heaven. In other words, there's no need for us to have sex, no need for those, uh, you know, earthly pleasures and all that stuff, which, perf you know, when you're married, it's perfectly great in the eyes of God to have sex with your spouse. But you don't do that in heaven. There's no sex in heaven, nothing like that. You don't need to. Why would you? You're, you know, he says you're going to be like the angels of God in heaven. You're going to have far greater things. And I know some people out there with the earthly thought, oh, what could be greater than sex, right? That's what an average adolescent man would say, you know what I mean? And, but the thing is, the angels of God, the, the things they got, you know what I mean? Well, you wouldn't even think about that stuff. And it's just uncomprehensible what these angels could do, the knowledge they have, and it's it's uncomprehensible that you would even think of with sex or nothing like that. You wouldn't even think about it. Then people suppose the question, yeah, well, well, what about the fallen angels? Why do they find favor in the women of men in Genesis six, right? They found favor in the women of men. They had sex with them and children. You don't learn about that in the churches these days, but that's what they did. They were enough of them. That's what demons are today. You know, I mean, we're going to get to that eventually. Because when the, the fallen angels came to heaven, they were stricken from the heavenly, um, if you want to call them powers, whatever the case. And they started, you know, being on the earth, yeah, they had the desires of men. Anyway, 31, but as touching. The resurrection of the dead, have you not read which was spoken to you by God, saying, like, no, he's quoting the scriptures again to these people. Have you not read the Bible, which was, I'm sorry, not the Bible, sorry, which would be the Torah or whatever the case. So have you not read the scriptures that was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. But when the Pharisees had heard it, they had put Sadducees to silence, and they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him the question, tempted him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? So here we go again to try to again get him to say something that's uh, uh, against their beliefs. To try to find some problem cause. You know, what they're doing is that they're doing everything, throwing everything under the, you know, but the kitchen sink. At Jesus to try to get him to say one thing wrong so they have probable cause to convict him. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love your neighbor, you shall love your, yeah, I'm sorry. Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart and all thy soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, these two commandments hang all the law in a prophet. So I want to point this out before we go any further. Because I know the dispensationalist movement today to tell you that the Ten Commandments no longer apply to us. They only apply to the Jews. Wrong. Big wrong. Because dozens of times in the scriptures, Jesus himself says to keep the commandments of God. That's the Ten Commandments. 
And we're going to go through this. We're going to go through the entire New Testament. Yeah. Then I'm gonna, I should have started with Genesis, but uh, I'm just going to continue straight up, uh, you know, the order. And we're going to go, you know, go to the Old Testament. Because the thing is, you can't not possibly understand the, old, uh, the New Testament if you don't understand the Old. So I'm going to read you the New Testament. Then we're going to go back to the uh, Old Testament to understand these things. The Ten Commandments are not just for the Jews, guys. And people say, well, we're automatically grafted in. And this is a contradiction of these people, right? You, first of all, you say the Ten Commandments are only for the Jews, right? But you say you're grafted into Israel. That is a question. Did not God say in Deuteronomy that if you come into my land, you're going to abide by my rules? And that's no longer um, the, the physical Israel, guys. It's a spiritual Israel. Doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Greek, rich or poor, like Jesus talks about in Galatians. Doesn't matter who you are. You come into God's Israel, you have to abide by his laws. The Ten Commandments are still law. They were not nailed to the cross. It was the ordinances. Ordinances and commandments are two different things. We're going to get to all this, guys. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, this is not saying that the Ten Commandments are abolished, because so, I know a lot of dispensationalists say, oh yeah, that's, no, it doesn't mean that. The Great Commandments doesn't abolish the Ten Commandments. Plain and simple. The Revelation 14, 12 says that you know, Jesus tells John on I am of Patmos to, for the saints, that's us in the end times, to keep the commandments of God and the faith of him. Plain and simple. And while the Pharisees gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think of ye Christ? Whose son is he? Then say unto him, The son of David. He said unto them, How then does the son, uh, no, I'm sorry, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, That the Lord unto him, my Lord sit upon my right hand until I make thine enemies my footstool? And if David then call him Lord, how is he his son? So this is Jesus asking the Pharisees on. They're loyal. So, and no man was able to answer him a word, not a word at all. Neither durst any man from that day forward ask him any more questions. So we just went through several chapters, right? You had the lawyers, the chief priests, the Pharisees, the scribes, all asking Jesus questions just to try to goad him to say something wrong so they could convict him, have probable cause, right? as a heretic or a blasphemous or something like that, and Jesus just counters right back. Answering a question with a question. And just making these people dumbfounded. And at the same time, de demonstrating, okay, demonstrating what a bunch of hypocrites these people are. Again, chief priests, scribes, Pharisees, lawyers, Jesus is schooling the heck out of him. After all this, <laughs> they were not able to answer him. Not a word. Neither any other man either. And from that day forth, they couldn't even ask him. They couldn't even ask him more questions. <laughs> yeah, this is such an awesome book. It really is. I love the book of Matthew. You know, I mean, I love this. It's so awesome. So, then again, uh, the Jesus Jesus spoke in parables for a reason, guys. So, thank you guys for joining us. And uh, we're going to get into chapter 23. And uh, again, don't take my word or somebody else's word for it. Read it for yourselves, guys. And do that right after this, too. Read it again for yourselves. And there's going to be stuff you're going to probably pick out of this that I missed, or whatever the case. And if there is, guys, if you want to add more into this, please, by all means, not in the comment section. I'm sorry, not, not in the live chat, because when it's premieres, uh, this, we have a chat room that goes on. So in the comment section, after the video is over, go to the comment section and say, hey, Dan, um, I think this verse says this or that. We can discuss it, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, and everybody in the chat room, too, or the, the live chat, please uh, socialize. What you do is pause this video right before it's over. If you guys want to hang out in the chat for a while, in the live chat, just pause the video before it's over, and uh, this way you guys can hang out for a little while more before I shut you down. So, and I'll try to be in the video here. So, guys, if you like the broadcast here, we got a uh, fundraiser platforms, PayPal, whatnot.
to help us raise money for our ministry in our new show where the Special Warfare is Wednesday and Friday and all that good stuff. And uh, check out the awesome shows over on IEC TV. And if you want a subscription to that awesome uh, paid site, which thousands of videos on demand, Dan demands a promo code, lowcase one word, nystv.org. So check them out, guys. And uh, thank you for joining us in this awesome comprehensive study. And check me out, guys, on truthradioshow.com for the list of our uh, spiritual warfare shows, guys. And uh, chapter 22, uh, comprehensive study, guys. And uh, stay tuned for chapter 23. So God bless Shalom, and you are the resistance. <laughs>